so apparently we are having difficulty going live, um, at least from my neck of the woods here. Uh, I guess you need some kind of wireless connection to do so, but you know what? Praise Jesus Christ, we're going to do this anyways. Um, I'm just going to bring the message that the Father has given unto me. And first of all, I want to start out and just say that this is not a pointed attack on homosexuality. This is a pointed attack on sin, just in general. Um, this particular topic for tonight is about homosexuality. Is homosexuality a sin in the eyes of the Lord? We will be doing messages on all sin. So, we're going to have a full message, I'm sure, on liars, too. So, liars, <laughs> your turn will come. So, we were down on Sunday. We were over at the church. Uh, well, let me just put it this way. We were preaching in front of a building that has decided to call itself a church. And it is, you know, we saw probably, visually, we saw 20 to 30 members. And it's called the Lakewood United Church of Christ. Now, these churches are all over the place. I've got one by my work in Arvada that is the same. It's the same exact church. They fly a rainbow flag outside of that church. Um, yeah. So let's, you know, th there were people that were coming out. We were preaching the word, um, trying to reach anyone, just one person inside there, trying to reach a soul for Jesus, for them to, uh, to hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Lord sent his preachers out that day. And we were trying to, you know, basically get the message out. Uh, there were a lot of folks inside. A few people were coming out here and there. Um, and which point there were, there were a couple of folks that actually decided to cross the street and come over and speak with us. Um, I did get the, you know, the honor for the father of speaking with these people. And while well, well, Brother Joseph preached, and the first gentleman that came over, he came over and he, he I could tell he, he had something heavy on his heart. And he asked that we not record him, and, uh, you know, we respected him on that. Um, he did want to speak with me. So I just kind of began and asked him if he was part of that church. And he said yes, and I asked him if, you know, he understood that um, homosexuality was a sin. Uh, he said, my son is gay. And I knew at that point that this individual, obviously, he was a grown man, he was probably in his late 40s. He's probably been dealing with this for a while. And so, you know, I I have sympathy for people. I have love for people, genuine love. And so I did ask him though, flat out, I said, have you, is your son aware that homosexuals, those who practice homosexuality, will not enter into the kingdom and his response to me was, show me in the Bible, can you show me in the Bible where Jesus himself says that homosexuality is a sin? Hmm. So, I brought up 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. through 10, And his response was, that was Paul. Show me in the Bible where Jesus himself says that homosexuality is a sin. So immediately I knew we had um, some 
some issues, some doctrinal, you know, basic doctrinal issues that were going to be going on there. So he, uh, he had left at some point, you know, I, I just, I just told him I'd be praying for him and that, um, that his son needs to turn out of that and, uh, you know, a, a gentle rebuke, but, um, you know, we were just kind of getting started and, uh, I, I've not personally firsthand had to do this. I have seen it done many times, you know, good, uh, children of the Lord God, strong men in Christ, um, preaching the word and, you know, giving the truth to people who need it. A lady came over uh, not too long after that, and she and I spoke, and the very first thing that she said was, show me in the Bible where Jesus himself says that homosexuality is a sin. And, I, of course, I gave her... Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, and she said the same thing that the other guy said. And so I, I told her flat out, I said, so it's obvious to me that this is a doctrine. This is something that you guys teach in your church um, that's being taught to you as doctrine because the other gentleman that came over said the same exact thing. So they're obviously being prepped with this particular um, message for people like me um, who will come and approach them with the Word of God. And the thing is, is that a lot of churches, a lot of different, you know, so-called religions will utilize the same tactic. They have a handful of scriptures, I would say anywhere between, you know, five to to. 20 scriptures, maybe, uh, I would say, that they lean on, because without leaning on those particular scriptures, um, and basically not uh, using the rest to paint, to, to see the big picture, then, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you, could, you could make, if you could single out a verse and make it say what you want, um, but the the Bible works the way it works is it use, uses all the scripture within it and uh, it is all in one big concordance with itself. There's nothing that contradicts. So then she proceeded to tell me that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was not about homosexuality but about rape. I... I uh, completely disagreed, and um, what's interesting about that is when I was in college, I took an Old Testament history class. Now, mind you, the colleges and these schools, they are Freemason institutions. I would say probably 95% of them. Uh, the Freemasons have their hands in everything. If you don't know about the Freemasons... You might want to start taking a look because they go way back into history and they are not on the side of Jesus Christ. I will say that much. So that's what that class taught. There was a, a, a gal, um, a woman who, who taught that class and she said she was a believer. But, you know, when I look back now, I can see that I don't know where she was getting her doctrine from. Um, at that time, I was not as strong in Christ as I am today. Um, I, I was strong in my faith and what I understood as Christ, but as far as when it came to the Word itself, I, I was lacking for sure. Um, so that class really, really rocked me uh, really hard. And, and what that class was designed to do, which I, I figured out years later. That class was designed to take this away as as being a firm foundation, a rock that you could trust in and know absolutely that it was the Word of God. 
That's what that class was designed for, no matter what they want to say. And so that was their, their premise even in that class, was that Sodom and Gomorrah was about rape and was not about homosexuality. So that's where we're going to start. We are going to start this evening with the statement that that lady made. And that statement is, Sodom and Gomorrah is about rape, not homosexuality. And by the time that I finish this message, I think it's going to be pretty clear that that is exactly what this, that story is about. Um, was it about rape? Yeah. Yeah, it was about rape. Was it about a homosexual rape? Yes. It was about homosexual rape. Um, so, we have to look first. Let's look first here. We'll go to Genesis 19, 4 through 5. That's where we're going to start. So just bear with me, folks. This is my first time doing this. Uh, praise Jesus. Um, he has made this possible. And um, I just I thank him for even just getting that opportunity uh, to go deeper into the Word. Any chance you get to study, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, write down scriptures. Uh, writing down stuff for me has always been very helpful. Um, in retaining, retaining things. So, uh, 19.4, Genesis. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night, bring them out unto us, that we may know them. So you have men compassing a house, asking for the men that were brought into the house. Um, a little bit of uh, backstory here. You know, So Lot is the, na the, the nephew of Abraham, and he's living on the edge, um, within, uh, the edge of the city within Sodom, um, and Sodom and Gomorrah were like twin cities, so I'm sure they were like probably pretty close within uh, each other's vicinity, if not neck and neck. And so, you know, these angels of the Lord God had come to Lot and his family to get Lot out of the city. And Lot wanted them to come in and stay for the evening before they were to leave the next day. And that's when, uh, of course, this occurred, and the, the townspeople, who were very uh, perverse, um, they encompassed the house and were banging on the door asking for these angels. And now Lot, he offered his daughters, who were, you know, virgins at the time, um, he offered his daughters saying that they'd never, they had not known the man at that point, and you guys can do whatever you want with them. They refused. Uh, they actually, they, they didn't want the daughters. That's not what they were after. So, if this was not, had nothing to do with homosexuality, if it was just about rape or about these intense desires, um, perversion, lust, if it was just about that, they would have taken the daughters, uh, if that was their aim. But they didn't want the daughters, they wanted the men. They wanted the angels of the Lord. Um... Sodom, in, in Hebrew, the word means burning, and Gomorrah means submersion. So, 
Um, I don't know if these places were, were given these names after they were taken down, uh, because it sure seems to be uh, pretty foretelling to me. So let's take a look here in Jude, verse 7. Go to Jude, verse 7. It is uh, the book that is just prior to Revelation. So Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here we had, um, you know, Genesis, obviously, Old Testament, and here we have New Testament, speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the interesting thing um, that I wanted to bring up is the Greek word for fornication is ek pornea. And it means, uh, the word ek, it means to go. And pornea means a whoring, uh, to be utterly unchaste. It comes from the word, yeah, it comes from the word pornea, which is the act of fornication. It can also be used in reference to worshipping idols. So, pornea, porn, uh, which that word is still around today, obviously. Um, another, just a small little um, fact, you have 26 letters in the English alphabet. X is the 24th letter. Two and four is six. So when you have X, 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 which is what they use for the porn, it's literally six, six, six. It took me a long time. I, I don't know why. Um, I've known that for some years now. But, you know, until someone points it out to you, it's kind of one of those things that's just kind of obscure. But um, the, a big point of our ministry here. The Lord's ministry that he's working through me and my brothers and, and sisters is to expose those things that, that the children of God might not know. They're just not something that's handed to you on a platter, like things that you'll see on, on everyday kind of, you know, media platforms. You won't find it there. These are things, these are deeper things, revelations that the Lord gives to his children who seek the truth and want to know the truth and love the truth which is exactly what this ministry represents and it's exactly um, what the Lord God saw in my brothers uh, prior to to pairing all of us up so I, I praise him for that I thank him very much for that um, you know it uses the word strange flesh and strange flesh what that means is Someone who is not your husband or wife in marriage. So we go to uh, Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So we see here that uh, when through the, the holy union of marriage, the man and the woman ordained of the Lord of that in that marriage become one flesh. And the Bible does, there are other verses uh, in the New Testament, Old Testament, where it's, it's showing that, you know, like my body is no longer 
um, my body. It, it's my wife's. My it's 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 reserved for my wife, just as hers is for me. Um, I am for her. So we have become one flesh. So when it says that these people went after strange flesh, it's saying that they went after uh, people that were not their men, uh, or their, their wives, or their husbands. And as we also saw there, the Bible in Genesis, which is the creation story, the very beginning of all creation, the Bible shows that that holy union is between one man and one woman. This is, it's inarguable that that's what it says. It didn't leave room for anything outside of that. Uh, there is nowhere in the Bible where it's spoken positively of that a man was with a man or a woman was with a, a woman. And another point, another reason that the Lord God has given that ability to uh, be joined with someone, not only because he recognized that Adam, you know, needed a helper. You know, we, we have, women have strengths that men do not have. Men have strengths that women do not have. Um, and, and together, though, um, we form this 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 union um, of of spirit, you know, of flesh, but of of abilities and things, and, uh, gentle natures. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm trying to think of the words. We complement one another. Okay, my wife, she's very gentle. She's very um, compassionate. For, for other people, um, and I am as well, but not to to the extent that she is, and I'm willing to admit that and and honest about those kinds of things that that and those are things that I uh, uh, admire in her and appreciate her for, and so um, and it, it does make me you know um, understand those kinds of things better through the eyes of my wife. And it's vice versa. So that's how it's supposed to be. And so we see Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. Let's go there. First Corinthians 1, 7 through 2. There we go. Okay. Now concerning the things, this is Paul speaking. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He's talking about being chaste, um, you know, staying away from lust. Uh, he says, though, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So he's showing that that is another reason that the Lord God gave um, this union, uh, that he allowed it to be a holy union, is so that we could avoid the fornication that comes. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. And so... By being married, it says that the marriage bed is sanctified in the Bible. And so when you are with that other individual, um, the things that you do with that individual on an intimate level, um, the, the Lord doesn't, it doesn't fall into the fornication category. It doesn't fall into the lust category. It doesn't fall into any of those things which are considered a sin before the Lord God. Um, because they are sanctified. The marriage bed is sanctified, which is why I would encourage anyone, you know, I know I didn't get the opportunity. Um, I was not convicted strongly enough. Um, I didn't have a lot of iron in my life, 
at that point when I came into the faith that, you know, someone could look me in the eye, a brother or could look me in the eye and tell me in love, Brother John, you need to stay away from physical intimacy until you're married. Now, obviously, I read the Bible. You could see it in there. But there's something about when a brother or sister comes to you in love and just says, and points something out, you know, something in the Word, something that they've been convicted of, okay? That conviction, and, and turn, you know, they've shown that that conviction has changed them. And that's where the power is. That's the ability that we're given as Christians and that testimony of overcoming. It helps other people in that regard, you know. So, to, to, for a brother or sister to love somebody enough to come to them in truth and what the Bible says, and also to know that, yes, if, even if you are a Christian woman, a Christian man, um, and you guys are, are starting to, you know, date, um, get together, um, all those things, you know, go out, it's, it is very important that you do keep from those selves. Keep yourself. Because it is a sin. It is a sin before the, the Lord uh, God if you guys are fooling around, as the world would say. Um, so, just know that. You know, I'm not, not trying to come down on anyone here. I just want you to know that it is a sin. And, um, I just, I wouldn't want you to to go any further without knowing that. So, um, so let's get into the next statement here. So we can obviously see that Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot to do with homosexuality. Um, you know, the words, as Brother Joseph pointed out in the last video, you know, the word sodomy, uh, I'm positive that the Lord has preserved that word. He has preserved it to this day. That's why it's still called sodomy. It's, it's that particular act. That's what it means. And it goes all the way back to then. When people hear that story, when people hear the word sodomy, that's the first thing that pops into their mind. For a reason. The Lord kept it around. You know, you don't see too many words that get, get um, kept like that. I will show you uh, another one that did, though. Um, let's see here. So, this next statement that was made by these folks from this congregation was, Show me in the Bible where Jesus himself says that homosexuality is a sin. Now, I knew when they said that, that it was going to be, uh, you know, when you're in the moment and you're talking to people, like you'd love to give them every last one of them the full rundown, which is why these videos are, are a great tool to be able to do that because you can reference these to people and say, you know, if you really want to know more, I, I gave a, a really good breakdown. You know, if I'm forgetting anything right now in our conversation, I gave a good breakdown in this video. You know, if you if you really care and you really want to know, uh, go watch it. So, you kind of have to go back to the beginning uh, with that question. You kind of have to really actually go back to why we have this faith at all, why we're believers in Christ, why we believe in, you know, the, the Lord God above, um, a creator, you know, and why the Bible is so important and why the word is so important and knowing the word and agreeing with the word. So the fact that both of them asked me this question it does show me that it is a taught doctrine in that church. Now, as we know, so what I, what I would have loved to have told them, um, which I did not have time, Jesus is the Lord God in the flesh. He's the Lord God in the flesh. We see this in John 1, 1 through 15. We're going to go there because this is an extremely uh, powerful scripture that is 
multifunctional when spreading the gospel and you know to to all kinds of different um, you know there's different religions out there people so um, and we need to be prepared for meeting those folks because there's still there's still people that that have an opportunity for the Lord to, to reach into their heart and to soften their heart. It just takes the, the right timing. It's always his timing, the Lord's timing. But he uses his servants. He uses people like, like you, people like me. In that moment, if we are prepared with his good word, you know, the Bible says always be ready to give uh, a reason for that hope that is within you. And so that is what he has been preparing me for um, so that I can address the gospel with someone of a different religion um, and, and try to steer, you know, show them their religion um, and how the Bible talks about where their religion is coming from um, and try to just show them their religion from a biblical aspect um, and then to lead them to Christ, to point them to the one who saves. No one else saves. No one. So, we have John 1, 1 through 15. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without him not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Catch that? He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own perceived him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word that, that's showing that we all have a purpose here. Um, none of us were born because we wanted to be. Uh, we didn't have a choice. Obviously, the Creator put you here for a reason. He put you here to get to know Him. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. So, we see here that Jesus is the same Lord God in the Old Testament. The Lord God is a spirit. The spirit came into human form, he was born into this world in the flesh. His fleshly form was Jesus. The Bible says he was fully God and fully man. So we see, let's take a look in Malachi 3.6. I have that lined up. Um, Malachi is Old Testament. Let's go there. So Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Okay. 
Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Okay. Malachi 3 6. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So, Lord God, um, not just not just here, but in many scriptures, it says that He doesn't change. He's always, always the same. So let's also take a look. Um, and so now we'll go into Hebrews. Go to Hebrews. 13.8 for our next verse. Let's 13.8. You guys are probably quicker than I am. 13.8. <laughs> Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Always the same. He doesn't change. He didn't change from the Old Testament God into the New Testament God. It's always been the same. He's got the same uh, nature, the same truth, the same life, the same way, the same uh Ability to reach the people he needs to reach. The same ability to, to soften hearts and harden hearts. The same ability to do uh, miracles. The same ability to, to oh, it's glorious. I'm sorry. It's just, uh, the Lord is so good. And, and I'm glad that he didn't, he didn't change his tune. It's, he's not a God of confusion. And we also see, you know, Jesus, at the time, uh, the only word that they had, you know, when Jesus was around, they didn't have the New Testament. So when he's, he's constantly quoting the Old Testament, always. So it seems kind of silly to me, I mean, because he was the word. And so, unfortunately, um, you know... These folks, they're, they're losing out. They're really losing out. Because to, to say that, oh, well, Jesus didn't say that. Hold on. We'll, we'll get into that. So let's look here, um, you know, in Matthew 19, 4 through 5. Because Jesus reiterates. He, he makes it a point to, to tell people what that holy union looks like. Here's Jesus talking about what is sanctified before him. 19.4 And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? And that, now that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Put aside. Break apart. So Jesus, you know, there's nothing that he came and said. There's nothing in the Bible that was said that wasn't said for a reason. Um, if you really start digging into the Bible, you'll find that, that nothing was spoken, you know, yes, we're supposed to, to rightly divide the word and context does come into play. Um, history comes into play, um, the times, you know, but the word is a living word. And so those things aside, the word will still speak where it needs to speak. And so, you know, I don't rely um, as much. Like, yes, you want to get context in terms of, like, take a whole chapter and see what that context is. 
you know. Um, but I will pull out a single verse because, you know, whether it's the, the side of a sword, the tip of a sword, um, even the part of the sword that's down there right by the blade, it's still a sword. It still cuts. It still does its job. So, let's see here. So Jesus clearly states what um, marriage looks like. A holy marriage. A marriage that is accepted in the eyes of the Lord. Now, let's, let's look at uh, an illegitimate marriage, if you will. Illegitimate relationships um, in terms of people who are being intimate with one another. Leviticus 18.22. Come on, you guys knew Leviticus was coming at some point. Here we go. 18.22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Okay, that's a uh, pretty clear statement. Let's go into 2 Timothy 3.16. Second Timothy three sixteen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, you know, the Bible does say that, that the Lord God raised his word above his name. Do you understand that the word itself... Um, All of it, from, from front to back, Old Testament, New Testament, has something for everyone. Um, there, this will never be a book that was just, you know, an old book from 2,000 years ago or from um, 15, I mean, 3,500 years ago. It will never be that kind of book, ever. This book is a living word. Let's see here. So, in, in that, um, when it says that all Scripture is given, um, right here, by inspiration of God, that word right there, when it says inspiration of God, is uh, theonoestes. I, I think I'm saying that right. That's the Greek word. And it means divinely breathed. It means God breathed. Like, and so, the Holy Bible is not just a book to, to glean a good message from. Or, it's, it's not only just applicable in, in metaphors or uh, inspirational quotes. It's either the word of Jesus, the creator himself, or it's not. One or the other. And if you don't believe that the Lord God was able to use men, that he moved men like you would move a pen when you write, if you don't believe that he could use men, you know, mere mortal men that he created, if you don't think that he could bring his spirit down and his will down to, to write through these people, it says they were inspired, they were God-breathed, then this, this book is not for you. Now, let's take a look here. So it's either a book by man, 
or it is the bread of life, as the Bible says. Because no other book in human history, not one, was written over the course of 2,000 years by 40 different authors in three different continents. Not one. Where men of God's, men of God, uh, prophets and disciples, they, they, most of these people, they never met each other. They haven't met each other. Yet, there is this, uh, there, there's no contradiction within the word. Uh, 2,000 years it took to write this. 2,000 years. And there's no contradictions in here. There's not. And if you think you found one, then, then get with us. Because we can show you. Uh, the Bible does not contradict itself. Because it was written by the same creator God who created you. Yes, he uses his book to speak of himself. Um, it's it's got a perfect unity to it. All of these people, you know, the the nature of God never changes throughout these two thousand years of them writing this. And so, if you think that that that's possible, um, for for men to have written this this book that doesn't contradict itself over that course of time, over that many people, and over, uh, you know, and being in different areas of the world, then, I mean, without the, the hand of the Lord God behind it, that's insanity. You know, over 25% of the Bible is prophecy. 25%. You know, and, and prophecy, for those folks who don't know, prophecy is when, when something is spoken... That has not yet happened. And it's said this will happen. Now, there are over, some, some say there are over, um, just over 1,800 prophecies in the Bible. That's a, that's a lot of prophecies. But, um, and some, some folks hold to 2,000. And I think that's probably dealing with, um, there are some minor prophecies and that they, they maybe aren't taking into account to get that 2,000. Um, uh, let's see here. All of these prophecies, um, the going rate is about 1,500 prophecies have been fulfilled to a T, which is impossible. I mean, some of these prophecies were fulfilled within a 40-year period. Some of these prophecies were fulfilled immediately. Some of these prophecies were fulfilled uh, hundreds of years later. To the T. That's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Now, can I mean, can you name one book that was written over 2,000 years? You know that the, the Quran was supposedly written by one man in 23 years. No one to corroborate, or corroborate, you know, the things that he's saying. It's just, you know, his word. His word over 2,000 years of uh, testimony. <laughs> you know, even the, the Jewish uh, Mishnah, which, which came before the Talmud, that took 130 years to write. It's not even close to 2,000 years. Um, and that was just based on um, the oral, you know, passed down traditional teachings that were within some of the synagogues. So, um, the word of the Lord God, it endures forever. Forever. And it is the word of God of Jesus himself, Old Testament to New Testament. So, having said all that, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. through 10. This, is not, this is not Paul's opinion. It's not Peter's opinion. It's not John's opinion. 
that Luke's opinion. This is the Holy Spirit writing through these men. And who's Holy Spirit? Who, who gave the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ. So if you're going to try to say, if you're going to try to say that this was uh, the opinion uh, of Paul, if you're going to try to, to say where does Jesus say himself, it's a sin. If Paul says it, Jesus said it. And that is the authority of the Bible. If you do not have the authority of the Bible, you should not be teaching it. You should not have a place that calls itself a church. I'm, gonna, I'm holding the Bible in the other hand, so I can't finish out that quotation. But let's read 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, but ye were sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So, if Jesus recognizes that the man and woman holy, uh, the union between them, you know, that he established um, only, that's the only sanctified marriage there is, then any, any relationship or homosexual relationship that's outside of those parameters will always be considered fornication. Always. That's just, that's the Bible, folks. So, the term abusers of themselves with mankind um, are, cynic, are cynicoidous, is the Greek word. And it means sodomite or homosexual. And effeminate, that word effeminate, suggests, there's a suggestion of pedophilia in that verse, um, in, in that word, in the Greek. That means soft. Um, the word is academite, and it's literally a boy kept for homosexual practices. So, Jesus had Paul write, he had Paul write about homosexuality twice in that one verse. No effeminate no abusers of themselves with mankind. Twice. That's Jesus. What I found, something I found interesting. Um, so, do you know what they called, um, so you had this Greek culture that was spreading throughout, you know, you had Rome and, and Greece all in the same area, and of course it was like, um, you know, the, the Lord's chosen people were there, um, and what they called that spread of Greek philosophy and, and culture, they called it uh, Hellenization. Hell. Hellenization. And that's actually where you see um, that a lot of the, the upper class people had what was called catamites. They had uh, basically sex slaves that were young boys, and it's really disgusting. Um, they even had uh, a Greek poet who, who loved boys. Um, in English, you know, in our language, they call him Marshall, which, you know, I know it's completely different, but when I saw that, you know, they spelled it 
M-A-R-T-I-A-L. So when I saw that, I, I'm like, martial law. I'm like, and that's actually something they are pushing uh, towards as we near these last days. Um, you know, yes, there will be martial law, but martial law, like, they're, they're bringing this stuff to pass. Um, another, uh, interesting thing. Let's take a look in Daniel 11.37. Very, very interesting. Come on, Daniel. Okay. Here we go. Daniel eleven thirty seven. So Daniel eleven thirty seven, um we find that the Antichrist, this is who he's speaking of, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, is a homosexual himself. It says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, the Lord God, nor the desire of women. Just a little something for you folks. Um, maybe we'll go deeper in on that at some point, but we'll just stick to what the Lord has given me at this point. So... In summary, um, you know, we know that these, these next elements, they're all part of the gospel of salvation. Recognizing first that we are sinners. Believing. Believing on Jesus Christ. Who died and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. Repenting. Repenting of our ways. Recognizing and agreeing with what Jesus considers sin. It's huge. Turning from those sins that we would be forgiven of those sins. You know, the main, <clears throat> the main problem with that church, that church, I'll get them in there, there you go. The main problem with that, um, if something is a sin, you guys, if something's a sin before God, but, you know, you have society or, you know, God forbid, a church, some function that considers itself a church, teaching that what he says, what Jesus Christ, what the Lord God says is a sin, is not a sin. How will they, how will they ever understand it, understand that they get, need to turn away from it? If they're, they're being trapped, the devil is really good at that. They're, they're being trapped. How are they gonna how are they gonna know to turn away from it if you got people telling you it's not a sin? Don't worry about it. You know, uh, it says that that denial, you know, that denial is found in John 3.18. I'm gonna take a look there. John 3.18. You know, these folks that they're going into it, it is a denial. You know, and they're being coddled in that denial. Right here, John 3.18. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He that believeth not is condemned already. So, and and I'll point this out too. I'm I'm almost I'm almost a hundred percent positive that the pastor of that church himself was a homosexual. Um, which it, it just it shows you that 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 people who love their sin. And they're not wanting to turn from it. Um, they'll flock. They will find people of that same nature, you know, and, and just allow, you know, it just allows this. Uh, it's uh, The Bible says, though the wicked, you know, walk hand in hand, they shall not go unpunished. You know, oh, you're wicked too? Like, lock arms with me. You know, we'll, we'll be wicked together and, and you know, nothing can, can break this. Um, you know, it makes them feel more unified in what they're doing. Um, more justified. And that's what's going on at this church. It's really sad. Um, you know, they need to let the, the light break through that darkness. They really do. You know, um... Let's look at let's look at Romans one twenty seven here real quick. You know the the rest of that while well, I'm looking for this the rest of that verse in John, you know it says that uh, for this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, um, but men loved darkness rather than light. They loved that darkness more than they loved the light. They didn't let the light work on them. They didn't let the light shine in them and, and, and make that darkness flee. They just, they, they liked, they loved. The Bible says they loved darkness. Um, so we are looking here for Romans one twenty seven. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use. Yeah, let's start. Let's start here. Um, yeah. Let's go to sorry, uh, Romans one eighteen. That's where I'm starting. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, uh, uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. I mean, are they, are they reading this verse in there? Somebody get them this verse. Who, uh, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the Creator more, or the creature, more than the creator. Isn't that the truth? Who is blessed forever? Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Yowza. And they didn't, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, which means they didn't like to retain this word in their knowledge, you know, uh, they've got the Queen James Bible out there. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but they've removed, in the Queen James Bible, they've removed every last scripture that deals with homosexuality. So there's a good chance they're not getting these verses. Um... So, they, they, the verses that they don't want to, to be dealt with by, because it's the Lord dealing with people through his word, when you read the scriptures, um, if it speaks to you, if it convicts you, let it, let it work. Let it convict you. It's not a bad thing to be convicted. It's not a bad thing necessarily to feel guilty. It's actually a good thing, because it's, 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 it's honesty before the Lord, it's, uh, being honest with yourself and recognizing that guilt and saying, Father, I, I am guilty. You know, your word, it says, it says that I'm not acting right. So it, it, it's a starting point between you and our Father, between me and, and my Father. You know, it's a starting point when you actually lay your sin out on the table, all of it, you know, as he reveals it to you. And says, look, you know, or as your, even as your, um, your brothers and sisters reveal it to you, you know, um, it's important that we, we look into these things. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's not convenient. You can't have a baby. You can't make life, you know. You can't be fruitful and multiply. Um, I mean, I'm not going to get too gross with it, but it's it's a exit, you know. Come on. Um, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, uh, unmerciful. Who, knowing the judgment of God, they know the judgment of God on, on these things, on these matters of sin. We all know them. Um, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It's that wildfire again. Um, so, let's also take a look, um, uh, let's also take a look at John 3.19. And in fact, I think... I think that's the one that I, I had quoted earlier. Um, so John three nineteen, yeah. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil, hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth, or doth truth, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. The Lord wants to, he wants to work with you. He wants to work what he does, his power, his mightiness. Um, 
You know, I, I, I pray that anyone watching this, you know, if there's a sin that you're dealing with, a willingful sin that you're dealing with um, in your life, admit it to him, first of all. Admit it. Don't try to make excuses or justify it. Like some of these churches, you know, um, especially this one that we preached at on Sunday. Believe in your heart that he desires to overcome it for you. And believe that he will. Believe that he will. And for any of our lukewarm brothers and sisters who are, who are not practicing homosexuality, but still condoning it um, through either um, being buddy-buddy with folks or um, promoting it or even not saying anything at all. Um, and I, I know it's something I have to work on too. I, I work in a, um, an industry where there are a lot of, of homosexuals. Now, my bosses are homosexual as well. I have, um, at, at minor points and minor times, I have addressed it. Um, I have, I've spoken to it. They know who I am, um, does that necessarily mean they'll know what I believe? Does that necessarily mean that they will know... That, has anyone else told them, like, hey, you need to turn from that? Um, they're not believers. But I tell you what, in my industry, I have run into um, gentlemen uh, and probably some women that I don't know about um, that are homosexual that, that say they believe in Christ. And it is, it is my, you know, it is commanded of me. It is something, you know, if I love my brother, my sister, if I love my neighbor, I will tell them. I will find a way. It doesn't mean you gotta just be like, hey, are you gay? You gotta turn from that. You know, like like this immediate exchange, but find a way to to let them know what the Bible says about it. I mean, that's the thing. They're 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 in a position where maybe they're not being told that. Maybe they have been told that. Maybe they need, you know, that seed has been planted and they need a little watering. They need somebody to come along. And, you know, because they, 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 people surround themselves with other people who are doing the same thing they're doing. And so these people aren't calling them out of that. These people aren't telling them, like, um, you know, that 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 says you're not going to enter the kingdom. These people aren't telling them that. And these are their, their friends. You know, these are the people that, but they, they put themselves in this position where these people, um, they're, they're going to put themselves with people that are going to tickle their ears. That's what it is. And uh, we don't want to do that. I don't want anybody tickling my ears. Uh, get behind me, Satan. That's what I say. So, to those lukewarm brothers and sisters, stop. Stop being a friend of the world. Stop making yourself a friend of the world. Okay? It's important. It's time. We are in the last days here. It is, it is so important. The Lord has shown me. It's so important not to be a friend of the world. Uh, read James 4.4. 4. And, and, you know, I, I know that one. Um... Just off the top of my head, it's, it's, uh, do you not know, actually I think it says, uh, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whosoever 
shall make himself a friend of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. And by by that I mean what he what the scripture means is, you know, you wanna you wanna uh, not take the scorn of man. You don't want people, you know, upset with you, offended by you. Um, you want to be in agreement with these things that the world is in agreement with. You're going to put yourself in a bad spot with the Lord. Um, you, you need to check yourself. We all need to check ourselves. Um, you know, we need to, to examine our, ourselves, the Bible says. You know, see that we be of the faith, the proper faith, the biblical faith. The one that says, you know, what is right and what is wrong. And, and, and hold ourselves to those standards, you know. And not be afraid, you know. It's not being legalistic to hold yourselves to the standards of the Lord God. And I'm not talking about the, you know, this is a totally different topic for another time. But I'm not talking about the, the law of ordinances, you know, um, you know, meats and drinks and things of that nature. I'm talking about the moral laws of the Lord God. These things that, that you know, like any child unto, or any parent under their child, you know, these things that you know, if they, they conduct themselves in these ways, um, it's going against your nature. Like your, your parental um, authority and, and um, it's going to hurt them in the long run. So you don't want that for them. And, and that's the same way that our, our Father is with us. And so um, I just encourage you guys to, to really um, seek after that, you know, obedience. Um, it's important, especially in these last days. Uh, we, we got, you know, the Bible says that people are going to be falling away. There's apostasy. You know, and I just wanted to bring up... Um, a couple more things, um, you know, when it comes to, I think we've, we've shown, you know, that, that homosexuality is a sin. It is. Just like lying, just like fornication, just like adultery, um, just like um, stealing, you know, um, uh, drunkenness. These things are sin. And, and unfortunately, they fall into the... Not unfortunately, but that's just the way it is. They fall into that category um, that the Bible says they're not going to enter the kingdom. So, you know, I've made it a, a, a something, a point for myself to, to make sure that I'm not falling in on that list. I don't want to be on that list. You know? I believe my salvation is secure if I walk in the Spirit you know, and continue to, to progress in that direction. But the Bible talks about people letting it get to a point where if they, they let that, if they, they're willingly um, practicing that same sin and, and they know the truth about it, that the Lord will hand them over to a reprobate mind. You know, uh, we look in Hebrews, it says that, you know, if, if someone willingly uh, sins, after having come to the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer a sacrifice for sin, but only a fearful expectation of fiery indignation and wrath. We don't want that. You know, I don't want that for my brothers and sisters. Um, I, I want to build you up. I want to see you walking with the Lord God in obedience and, and you know, taking on His righteousness you know, and Him living through you in the way that, you know, that, that clean vessel, that, that, that vessel of honor that, that He's trying to make of you and of me and of, you know, all our brothers and sisters. You know, those are the kinds of things we should be seeking after. It says, seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness, it says, and all the rest will be added unto you. But we got to get our brothers and sisters out of this world. We've got to get them out of the world. We're in the world, but not of it. But a lot of brothers and sisters, and I know I was at one point completely of it. Uh, more of it than not of it, that's for sure. Um, you know, and there's, 
there's a real agenda out there. There's a real agenda to sexualize our children. The children of God. Not just not just us adults, um, but I mean like our children in their 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 movies, um, the shows they watch. It is widespread. The devil works he's he's very well organized. Um, he I mean, if you think about all the, the TV shows, you know, I, I don't watch TV anymore. Well, the last time I was watching TV, you know, on a regular basis, you know, every other show had a, a you know, at least one gay character, um, you know. And then they're always, they're joking about being homosexual. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Um, you know, they're joking about... Um, you know, they always have the men dressing up as women. Um, that's a thing in Hollywood. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, it's a thing where, you know, these people, they have to do things for Satan. When you get to a certain level, you know, Satan, he doesn't just hand it all over to you, you know, where, where Christ, he, he gives us everything. You know, it's a free gift. He gives us everything. If we just move in his direction, and follow that light. Where Satan, he, you know, he demands. He wants something from you. Every time. All the time. Oh, you did this for me. Well, now you're going to do, you're going to do some more for me. You know? Oh, you did that last time? Well, we're going to step it up a little bit. That's how Satan works. Um, I mean, these people are literally like, I would not wish Hollywood on my worst enemy. We are taught to tell people, go to Hollywood. You know, oh, you've got such a great talent. Man, listen to that guy sing. Did you hear that? Do you hear the way he played the guitar? Send him to Hollywood. Get him up there. No. Don't send him to Hollywood. Don't. I have, I've got to warn people prior. When I saw them, I mean, they were starting to make that progression. I warned him. He... He never got the warning. The guy I gave the warning to, to give over to him, the guy that I was in contact with that knew him, I gave him the warning. I said, tell him, man. Tell him. He died. Uh, in a very odd way. Um... And the next thing you know, the guy that I was needing to warn, he's big. He's in Hollywood right now. Um, doing, you know, spots on Jimmy Fallon. I tried. Should have tried harder. You know, these are, these are, we have to start looking at people like, these are God's children out there. You know, not all of them have been adopted. You know, but I have faith and hope that you know, I just keep that 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 hope that there's no one so hard um, of heart. There's no one who is waxed waxed so cold that I can give them a, a good word that that might sink in that they'll think about some truth to chew on, you know, that might help them come to Jesus Christ. That's that's what this is all about. This whole ministry of his. That's what it's about. It's about bringing people to Christ. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I am, I've been working all day and I'm, I'm super tired, but... Um, I love talking about the things of the Lord. Um, even though these, these, this is the other end of things, you know. Um, sometimes we have to use these kind of things. Uh, you know, it, it worked for me. I'll say that. There was a point where I didn't, I believed in the Lord and in, in, in Jesus and, and, you know, I believed in the Bible, but I didn't, 
I didn't, I couldn't, Satan blinded me. He literally blinded me to his ways, to thinking that he was real. I couldn't see him in the things I was doing. I couldn't see him in the world. And so I prayed. I prayed right here, right in this, like, I mean, not right in this spot, but, you know, maybe over there a little bit. And I prayed, and it was a genuine prayer that the Lord would show me Satan at work. I said, show me, Father. Show me him working in this world. I want to see. Now, I don't... If you have a heart for it, if you have a stomach for it, you know, you could maybe pray that same prayer. You know, or you could, you know, understand that, that there are some of us, there are many of us brothers who are very genuine um, with the Lord and therefore would be very genuine with you and be able to kind of uh, a guide if you will, uh, you know, let this, the Holy Spirit guide you, but kind of, you know, that way you're not trying to take in so much at one time because it's a, it's a whirlwind of information uh, that the Lord has given me in terms of Satan working in this world. Um, but like I said, sometimes, you know, if people aren't trying to hear the word of God, if people aren't trying to hear the word, okay, so you don't, you know, it's kind of a form of apologetics, if you will. The the type of apologetics the Lord has given me. Um, you know, if the gospel isn't working, then okay. You know, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you Satan, Israel. You know, and that that's going to spark something. You know, because if Satan is real, and they start seeing like, wait a minute, like. Wait, that's going on here, and this wickedness is going on here, and, like, there's got to be something. There's got to be the other end of Satan. And there is. Praise Jesus. That he is, uh, he's already won that battle. Um, but we're still in it. You know, we're still in uh, the crossfire of that battle. Um, not that we have anything to fear when it comes to men. And we don't fear men. You know, we fear God. We need to fear God. We need more people to have more fear of God. It's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing to fear the Lord. I can't say it enough. Um, you know, you've got... Um, let me get back into this real quick, you know. You've got all of this media attention on these things of transgenderism. Jenner's out there, you know, Bruce Jenner. Um, they highlight these kinds of things for a reason. They bring it to the forefront so that it normalizes it. You start thinking, like, everybody out there is, you know, going gay. Everyone out there is turning homosexual. Everyone out there is, you know, thinking, I don't know what I am anymore. Am I a man? Am I a woman? Uh, maybe I'm a little bit of both. Uh, in middle schools, children, and I don't know if it's your children's middle school, but in middle schools, they're being given, like on the first day of school, when you're filling out that little, like, you know, hi, my name is John. Um, you know, I like, I like dogs. <laughs> you know, just like that simple stuff. You know, they have a, a part of that form that says, uh, you know, what do you identify as? And it's not just male or female. Like, it's not like, are you a male? Or like, you know, you always have to check the M or the F. They've got, like, more choices now. <laughs> a lot more choices. Um, and they're, they're working on the children's minds. They're trying to create another generation of people who do not have um that that resistance to those kinds of things you know and that's on us the parents we have the word we can read it you know we can um 
We have the Holy Spirit that can can get inside and, and find ways. You know, the Lord finds ways where there's no ways. He makes ways. He's the way maker. So, you know, if you ever think like that, that your back is up against a wall, read the Bible. <laughs> um, there's lots of folks in the Bible whose backs were against the wall. And uh, the Lord pulled them out of it in miraculous ways. So, oh yeah, I was telling you that. So this dress thing, these men, you know, you start getting to the top, right? And at some point, they make you wear a dress. As a man in Hollywood, they're going to give you a dress. They're going to give you a role, um, whether it be, it's usually in a movie, and they're going to put you in a dress. Whether it be for a scene or you spend the whole movie, you, you know, you're a woman. Um, it's a ritual that they do. It's, it's a satanic... Why do you think they call it Hollywood? Holly is the, uh, from a holly tree. Now, holly was always used by um, the occult, by witches. They would cut their, their little wands from the holly tree. And they were used for spells of sleep for like you know enchantment and 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 being in a trance hollywood people are are in 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 uh enchanted by these people i was at one point i mean people look at these folks like just so starry eyed and like you know goo goo gaga over these folks um you know, they know their movies, they know the lines of the movies, they know, you know, how many cats they have. They, they know all of these things about people they don't know. <laughs> uh, it's called idolatry, folks. It is a modern-day idolatry. Every time that you go, I'm going to say this flat out, every time that you go and you go watch a Hollywood movie at the theaters, or you go purchase a Hollywood movie, anything coming out of Hollywood, you are putting money into the devil's pocket himself. The devil himself. That is his realm. Just like the, the media. The, me, the media, it's all corrupt. From the bottom to the top, it's corrupt. You know, we got to go about it the Lord's way. You know, we want to reach people, we got to go about it the Lord's way. Which is just taken to the street with nothing but the clothes on your back and, and the Word of God. That's what we got to do. That's the way that He established it. It's the way we see all the disciples doing it. Why would we try to do anything different than this, the disciples did? I mean, they all did the same, they had the same method. You know, I guess there are folks that, that aren't disciples. Um, but I would just encourage people in these, in these last days to, to pick up your sword. Pick up your cross. Pick up your sword. So, it's not widespread at this point. I mean, there are a lot of folks that are, are definitely going the path. And the, it's the wheat and the tares, and they're being separated right now. They've, they've grown up together, and they look exactly the same the whole time. Can't tell. You can't tell until harvest. They look exactly the same. But... You know, the Lord right now, he's, he's polarizing his people from the world. He's calling them out. The Ecclesia, he's calling them out. 
out of these, these four-walled buildings with ridiculous doctrine that are just religion, uh, bundled up, you know, and with, with some faith paint on them. You know, I call it the Christian veneer. A lot of these, these all these uh, holidays that came from pagan, you know, pagan RCC, the Roman Catholic Church. These are, they're Christian veneer. They're pagan holidays that were given like this whitewash of Jesus Christ. But there's no substance of Christ in them. They're not of Christ. They're not of the Father. They're not for us. Um, but that's, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little off topic here. Um, I haven't done this before, so I'm like, uh, I want to I want to talk with people. So, Jesus bless you guys. Um, hopefully this wasn't a complete disaster, um, and you got something out of the message. You know, it, um, if you need to, go back uh, and, and find those scriptures that the Lord gave me um, to really show you that, that, you know, homosexuality, yes, it is a sin. Jesus spoke against it. Uh, the Bible speaks against it, therefore Jesus speaks against it. And that's, that's just that pure, sound doctrine. Okay? Build your doctrine on the rock. Um, and go out and love your neighbor as yourself. And tell people the truth that they need to hear. You know? Alright. I love you guys. Um, I love you all, my brothers and sisters. And uh, have a blessed night, and we'll be uh, back at it tomorrow. All right. <laughs>